So page 375, question 5 turns out to be invalid. If you have two statements, Well, in these in these exercises, we're not concerned about whether or not the premises are true or false. So, don't get upset by saying that we've concluded that animals are not conscious or any of that sort of. We're just right, right. Oh, no, that, that change wasn't. the letters to mean whatever you you like. We're just doing the form of the argument to see if the argument is valid or invalid, not whether or not these statements are true or false. Uh, I was just asking, uh, with the squiggly R and squiggly P, instead of having them, them be in separate areas, if you brought that to squiggly R and squiggly P, is there any... That would that? change the argument form. It would? Right. Um, in this case, so if I had a conjunction here, in a way, I could easily create that because since I have these two premises alone, <laughs> I can conjoin them, and that would not change the argument. Okay. Because if, if I say I have a pair of glasses and I have a watch, okay. so I have a pair of glasses and I have a watch, that's one of our our valid forms. That's conjunction. It's true unless one is false. Right. Okay. Cool. I was and, and doesn't that seem like it would always be true, as long as the two premises are true? Yeah. The conjunction of the two of them would always be true. Can you think of any weird example where that wouldn't be the case? I mean, you'd have to be on drugs or something, I guess, in order to feel like. Woodstock? Mm. How do you make your face feel like rubber? You know, or, sorry, I'm trying to imitate Steve Martin. You've seen Steve Martin in The Death of Socrates? Should we do some, like about five minutes of entertainment? Mm -hmm. we, can, we can do that. Just to get everybody entertained for a minute. I wonder if that will actually come up. Subtitles are totally screwed well, up, aren't they? What was the verdict? When do I get out of here? The Socrates, the verdict was dead. Death? You gotta be kidding me. For what? For teaching the youth wisdom? Well, I'll take it all back. Call him in here. I'll renounce everything. Let's get out of here. Let's go get some Chinese food. But Socrates, you drank the thing up. So what? Thank you. 
halo. Kan lo mau poison it, and one is not poison it? The kind of thing that irritates me about you guys. Oh. All right. Well, I'm going to die. So what? When does stuff take effect? Two, three years? Two, three minutes. Because the dialogues are mostly people asking Socrates questions. In the latter ones, anyway. rubber back then. <laughs> you didn't have chocolate chip cookies either. kind of hallucinogen. He's just pretending, I think. That's obviously not the real death of Socrates from the Phaedo. But Wait, that wasn't historically accurate? No, because they didn't have color photography at the time. Right. I guess. Seems like they would have to. They're mechanical. I've never broken one. Yet. I have one at home. We never use it. Because the projector was stolen. So we don't have a projector for it. We had the kids over the house while we were away visiting one of our kids. And when I got back, the projector was missing. But as far as our daughter's concerned, none of her friends would have stolen it, so it's kind of sad. 
but that's okay. All right. Well, when this place does its yard sale, you should hit them up. <laughs> no, we're... That's passe. That's old stuff. Yeah, we don't, we don't use this um, anymore. That was years ago. I thought it was way better to have a projector than a TV. It can be. But... Can you do number 13 or 14? 13. Mm -hmm. That's the one I wanted to with you. Mm -hmm. I got it. So that's if Joyce went south on I-15? No, no, no. I'm sorry. 14. Oh, 14? If you did not finish the job by Friday? So this isn't going to be valid, I'm pretty sure. But let's check. We want this to be false. If that's going to be false, then not B is going to be true. We want this to be true, which means that that's going to be false. So if false, then true would be true, and true, but false. So this is invalid. Make sense? Yes, somewhat. So remember, we were going over the logical operator, and you were talking about that the if then conditional statement. Mm -hmm. The so so p then q true. Uh, so if it's, I'll, I'll just put them under here. So if it's true, true, that would be true. If it's true, false, that would be false. If it's false, true, that would be true. And if it's false, false, that would be true. So this is the meaning of the horseshoe. In this particular case now, we have a negation sign on each side. So the pattern stays the same, assuming that it's not P that's true, right. et cetera, right? So real, really what I'm looking at here, would, P would be false, but since not P is what I'm, I've got here, right? The, the reason I did this was so that you could see that the meaning stays the same regardless of what this looks like, right? So, there's something I was thinking would be neat to show by doing that, and I can't think what it was. Because these can get way more complex. We're, you know, when we're talking about just P and Q, we're talking about the simplest form of that statement, but they can become much more complex than that. And in fact, in this exercise, they're getting a little bit more complex on purpose, right? Um,
let's go to chapter 8, Natural Deduction. So it starts on page 382, but 383, notice, it talks about natural deduction. It's a proof procedure by which the conclusion of an argument is validly derived from the premises through the use of the rules of inference. Right? There's a limited number of the rules of inference uh, that we're using as our guide. Theoretically, I suppose, you could create an infinite number of rules of inference that are valid because you just need to combine them. It's like creating the longest sentence, right? You can have an infinitely long sentence that no one will utter uh, because it would be useless, right? You never get to the end of it, right? It's like that, I, I guess it's a German joke um, where the... the uh, Two guys uh, were listening to a, a German speech, and uh, the one guy could understand German and the other guy couldn't. And so as the guy was giving this, the lecture in German, and the other guy was listening to it. His friend, who didn't understand German, kept asking, what's, what's he saying, what's he saying? And he kept saying, I can't, I can't, I don't know yet, because he hasn't gotten to the verb. He hasn't gotten to the verb. You know how German sentences or the verb always comes at the end? You didn't know that. Okay. And, and their sentences are so long, but you don't actually know what the sentence is going to mean until you get to the very end and you hear the, the verb. If, you're, if you've ever listened to German, that, that's... Translators might have a hard time. Nine. You get used to it. Yeah, I, the, the difficulty in translating is not knowing what the speakers are saying. It's translating into another language. So it's, you know, I don't know unless you speak another language. You know, it's hard to, to get, I, I guess, that you can understand what they're saying in this language. You can understand what they're saying in this language. The difficulty is trying to explain in this language what was said in this one. You realize you're never going to be accurate. Does that make sense? It is considered an art. And there's some really wonderful books out there about Problems in Translation. That's the title of one of them. Uh, a, a really neat one is, is that a fish in your ear? <laughs> Which, as you could tell, that's clearly a problem in translation. Is that a fish in your ear? Well, there are a lot of things that different, different cultures say as like puns and slang and just the way that they get a point across. So there's a fish in your ear could actually have a very reasonable meaning to it. Just circumstantially? No, I don't think it does. But the, I, I suppose the um, maybe I'm, in in the book it did not. It was a misun misunderstanding of what was being said. Oh, you're just thinking English, but, like you don't say. I mean, to uh, right. other culture, you you don't say what. Like, right. What do you oh, there's about? lots of expressions <laughs> like that. Yeah. Oh well. But, but so, um, how did I get it? What an what a odd thing to get onto. Um, but so, we use, it, it's also referred to as the propositional calculus. So the idea is, you, if, if you know that there are a limited number of valid argument forms, and we've got them right here, right, on your, your chart, the eight implication rules, Right? 
Mo I, and I, I mentioned the modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, disjunctive syllogism, simplification, conjunction, addition, and constructive dilemma. Right. So those are it. That's, that's all we've got. Uh, but you can combine those to get more and more complex arguments, right? Uh, and so if you're, you're given an argument, uh, I, you know, I'm trying to pick a real live one, you know, uh, say the president says that you four uh, uh, legislators ought to go back to your countries, you know, and fix them, you know, you know, and then, you know, so he said that, and all four individuals he referred to were from minority groups, uh, so therefore he must be racist. So now you have an argument, right? Uh, you might have to add some other premises to it, indicating that telling people to go back to the country where they, they came from is an, in, is an indication of racism. Or something, you know. Um, and, pardon? Have, have you all feel like getting anything off your chest or you know saying who the hell and where did we get this guy? You know. It's like watching a really bad sitcom. I, I can't do it. <laughs> I, blame, I personally blame New York City because I've been there and I've never liked the people there. It's almost like the higher up in the building you go, the worse the people are. And, in New know, York? He's from a wealthy family, so he's up from a really high up building. <laughs> so it just, maybe it's the radiation from the sunlight, that there's no protection because the buildings are so tall. It just makes these weird weird. Things. Sorry I brought it up. Uh, <laughs> that's just... And, and by the way, two of his wives so far are from other countries. Just saying. And he could go back to Russia, you know, apparently. You know, that's what somebody, I, I think it was no, he's German. one of the, well, somebody picked on Russia and said he should go back to Russia and try to fix what's wrong there and then come back and try to. Has he gone off the plane? Putin would be standing there with "Take My Breath Away" playing. <laughs> <laughs> That's disgusting. My, I'm sorry. Am I I'm getting kidding. all this coffee? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so the whole point of natural deduction is, if we we already know valid rules of inference or implication rules. We could put those together and basically conclude if a more complex argument is valid or not. Um, proof is a sequence of steps, etc. Implication rules are valid argument forms that we've already looked at, we've already gone over them. And the other is replacement rules, which we haven't done yet. Um, moving on, page 385, the first implication rule is modus ponens. We've discussed these. So I wasn't going to go over them again. But notice on this page, page 385, it also gives you valid applications of modus ponens. So as I've been saying, um, notice that in, if we're just talking if P, then Q, P, therefore Q. That's the basic shape of this inference that we make. If this, then this. But I do have this, so I must have this, right? That's, that's the shape of the thought. But notice if you look, um, there's a, a, a other valid you know, uses of it. Uh, the first one here on the bottom left is if R, then M or N. But I do have R, so therefore I do have M or N. Notice that's a little bit more complex than an FP than Q. P, therefore Q, right? Because you're going, if the left, then the right. 
Well, but I do have the left, so then I have what's on the right. And notice what's on the right is M or N in this case. So that's a little bit more complex than just Q, right? For another example, even more complex, right, in the middle, at the bottom of the page, if P and Q, then G and not D. But I do have P and Q, so therefore I have G and not D, right? So you can see the, the shape of the, the inference is the same, right? Same thing with the last example here. Uh, either K and D or F. Premise two. If either K and D or F, then M or C. So therefore, M or C, right? So the premises don't even have to be in proper sequence. Plus, they can be more complex. But you're still looking at the inference that if in one premise you say if this, then this. And as long as you have the if part, then you have the this part. Notice on the next page, though, you can screw up the symbols. You can end up with argument forms that are not examples of modus ponens, right? So, for example, either if L then Q or either R or S. But it is the case that L, so therefore Q, that's wrong. What are they thinking? Since you have if L then Q and you have L, you're thinking, well, I have Q. But the problem is you don't have if L then Q you have either if L then Q or R or S. So you can't just take the if L then Q out of there by itself. It's not free for you to apply modus ponens and get Q. It's attached. It's part of a disjunct. So that's an error. Same thing in the second example there. Uh, if L then Q or either R or S, but I do have L, that doesn't mean that I can conclude R or S because L by itself doesn't give me if L then Q. It actually does. I can actually do that, but because I could always add not Q, that could always give me if L then Q, and then I can say R or S. But the point that they're making here is that you cannot uh, use the form modus ponens in order to get R or S from that as it is. That would be an error. We talked about the fallacy of affirming the consequent already. Um, so the, the next inference rule, modus tollens, we've talked about that one. That's if P, then Q, but not the case Q, therefore not the case P. And notice you get valid applications of that. And no notice what they're just doing here is making it more complex looking. So you have to get used to looking for that shape of the, the inference, right? The argument. And that is if the left, then the right, but not the right therefore not the left. See how that works, right? Does it help when I put it in that kind of a directional thing? It seems so. to me that that's, that's what's going on here, right? They don't say it that way, but that's, you know, if this, then that. Well, that's, that's, so the connector is connecting the two sides, right? It's, but if you're looking at the relationship between the two sides, modus ponens, if this, then that, but I do have this, so I do have that, right? Modus tollens, if this, then that. But I don't have this, so I mustn't have that. This is for my granddaughter. Aww. 
she is 33. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the cuteness just went. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. All right. Okay, so modus tollens. So valid applications of modus tollens. If H, then T or N. But it's not the case that T or N, so therefore it's not the case that H. Can all of you see what I'm reading, or some of you don't have a text? Do you have, do you have it in the, no? So I should, I should write it down for you to see. much easier if you can actually see it then. <laughs> Unless you're brilliant, you know, you, I, and I actually, I'm sure you're, I'm sure every one of you are absolutely brilliant. I'm sure all of you are, your IQs are much higher than mine, because of course you know the co cohort thing, you know, right? Yes? The Flynn effect? Heard of the Flynn effect? I mentioned it, right? Yeah. It's got to screw up the intergenerational relationships when you've got old people that are so much dumber than you are, you know. Well, didn't we say that the, those on, uh, we're starting off smarter at a younger age, so somebody older than us is smarter? But Me, well, that's nice. Thanks. I didn't think of that, of course. I mean, so technically we'd be, like, I guess I would Soon be smarter, smarter than you were when you were 28. But, I mean, that's the way Well, that's certainly, anyway. that's certainly the case, too. Hmm. I mean, I had joined the Army when I was 26, so obviously I was dumber than you were. <laughs> I met it means that I was going to. <laughs> Okay, so the second example of a valid application of modus tollens is if G and D, then C. But it's not the case that C, so it's not the case that G and D. So if you, you have that, you can see it. That's important to be aware uh, people do make mistakes with these inference rules, of course. Um, as, as an example of a misapplication of modus tollens, we have the example here, if L then Q or R or S, but it's not the case that Q, so therefore not the case that L. Again, you, you can't take the, the conditional statement, if L then Q, out of that disjunct and do things to it with the inference rules, it's attached to the whole thing. So you can't just take parts out with inference rules, etc. Hypothetical syllogism, next page. Notice if P then Q, if Q then R, if P then R uh, is the conclusion. Uh, we use this an awful lot. And remember, you can connect the dots all the way down the page because one thing leads to the next. So if P then Q, if Q then R, if R then S, if S then T, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down, you could start off then by going if P then et cetera, right? Hypothetical syllogism. Valid applications of it, if H then either S or N, if S or N, then not the case R. So if H, then not the case R. You see it? See how it works? Same thing with the second example. Um, much more complex. If either G and C or P, then not the case S. If not the case S, then M. 
So therefore, if either G and C or P, then M. And that follows hypothetical syllogism, etc. Notice misapplications of it. If K, then L or not R. L and not R, then M. So if K, then M. But the problem is you don't have exactly the same set of symbols in the antecedent of the second premise as you do in the consequent of the first premise. They don't match. They would have to match for you to do that, etc. Ah, mode of the bridge. Mode of the bridge. Jonas Tolens means. Mode of the toll. Mode of the toll. Hypothetical syllogism. Why is it we use hypothetical. I don't know why any of them are named what their their name. Why was Alice the one that ended up in Wonderland? Could have been Gertrude. So the hypothetical isn't in reference to anything. Hypothetically, it isn't. Oh, great. Thanks. It is one great big conditional. So, so if you're thinking, well, if this, then that. And if that, that then, you know, I mean, I mean, think about it. You know, there's a lot of ifs in all of this, right? And any one of those could break down. So it really is hypothetical. But hypothetical. I'm trying to think. I mean, that should be Greek, right? What is so that, that, what is, It's not hyper. With hypo, hypo. So that means low. I know that much. And thetical, so. What is a thetical? Thesis? Thought? There we go. Sorry. I could Sorry. make that the quiz question for tonight. <laughs> Why is hypothetical syllogism named hypothetical syllogism? We, I, I get the sort of answer where it's like it's conditional. And if anybody gets mad at me for it, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Is that the first quiz question, though? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Oh. Is that a good first quiz question? That way it'll remind me to look it up myself and try to figure out. What does it mean? I have a question. So the hypothetical syllogism is a valid form of argumentation, correct? Yes, yes. So even though it's hypothetical, I'm just, so my, my question is. So the form is, is valid. Form the, is valid. The Whether the premises are true. Premises are true not. is totally I mean, because so so if I, I'm saying something like um, if Trump says things like he did this what was it yesterday? About people from that don't look like him. Let's let's call it that, right? If Trump speaks the way he does uh, of people that don't look like him. Actually, you know, it's really people that don't agree with him. Because there's no one that looks like him. Right? So, it's, so if anything, it's got to be, you know, people that don't look like him. Then, Oh, that's too complex. I'm going to make a mess of it. But what I was going to suggest is let's let's have something questionable in each case. It's not not you know if this ball hits this ball and then this ball hits this ball and then this ball hits this ball and then this ball hits this ball. So then I hit this ball 
dish, 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 dish. That's pretty clear, right? That okay. you know, that's something we would expect not just from this argument form being valid, but just from practical experience called physics. That that's a chain of causal relationships, right? Oh. But what we're looking at here with this argument is if I say, well, if the cost of living goes up, then uh, you know people will have a rougher time of it. You know, if people have a rougher time of it, crime will go up. If crime goes up, then uh, the quality of life will go down in the community. And if the quality of life goes down in the community, then more people will leave that have the ability to leave, which means that the end result is that the community will become more impoverished, right? So each step of that way, right, you could say, okay, that's a big hypothetical syllogism, multi-premises long, right? Yeah. But I could be wrong at every single one of those. Okay. But it's still a valid argument. But it's still a valid argument form. Okay. okay. And, and yes, it's a valid argument. The question, of course, is, but what about the premises? Are the premises true? Because you know, none of those might turn out to be the case, right? There are lots of things that could um, affect, and yet you hear a lot of people actually saying that very argument with regard to the state of the state right now because of the cuts, uh, um, et cetera, right? All the good people are going to leave. <laughs> they say, they're saying that. You know, there are folks saying that. That's pretty, pretty, you know. Cheaper land. <laughs> That's just kind of crazy, crazy thing. Okay. But is it crazy if we've seen it demonstrated in other places? Well, I would say that there are places that have experienced similar things, but there are other places that did not. So there are other factors involved. In a, each one of those hypotheticals, right? Okay. They're more statistical you know, than... Uh, that makes sense. I mean, the earth is... The quality of life on the earth is deteriorating. So are you going to leave? <laughs> That's not, not a better place that I know of. At least not that's easier to get to, as far as I know. I thought what was neat was, though, that Walmart is using the Oculus Rift now to test its employees to see who gets promoted. Who saw How? that Who saw that one coming? Did you see that? Why? No? How? For what? So the idea, it, I guess, in order to get promoted, uh, an employee would take a test to see how good they understood the store and the policies and everything else. Apparently Walmart's come up with the idea of putting the Oculus on the, the person and giving them a virtual reality test. So they're actually in an aisle and they have to make selections on what things they would prioritize to do and everything. So they're using a virtual reality device in order to test people. Who saw that coming? You know, that's, that's I wonder amazing. how that's beneficial at over like physically doing it. <laughs> I mean there's the, the cost of the Oculus Rift set up and you know, training people to train people. Well, if you just it. have one per store and you train ask people to put it on. Yeah. I'm sure it's not that expensive, actually, no. Well, how many Walmarts are there now? <laughs> I think there are a few. I think it's the largest employer in the United States, isn't it? That's disturbing. Pardon? That's disturbing. That's true, that's disturbing. You know, people get married in Walmart? <laughs> mm -mm. In the South? <laughs> no, in Wasilla. Yeah. Shut up. Okay. Are you serious? Yes. Yes. 
They got married in aisle five. What the hell is an aisle five? I don't know. But. <laughs> what? Family planning. I don't even like. I can hear the banjo music in my head. I don't even. Deliverance. Yeah, that that would change. <laughs> that would change the kind of answer you'd give to the first question of the first test, right? What kind of music would you arrange for your friend's wedding? At Walmart. D Diaz Ire might play. You know, for the I do part. That's the wrath of God. But you know. So that was a joke, but it didn't go over. Okay. So disjunctive syllogism, P or Q, but not the case P, therefore Q, and vice versa. If P or Q, but not the case Q, then P. Notice valid applications of that. So, so notice that in, in this section, they're not only giving you the a reiteration of those inference rules, but they're also pointing out that there are more and more complex applications of it, but also beware uh, that people do use it incorrectly. Can you give an example? So page 389, we've got four examples of using it correctly. First one, if R than P or S, it's not the case that R than P, so therefore it is the case that S. You see it? Mm -hmm. Second one, either if R than P or S, but it's not the case that S, so it must be the case if R than P. Everybody have enough protein in the brain to do these? Next example, either G or if H and R, then S. Not the case G, therefore if H and R, then S, etc. But the misapplication example that they give you here is either F or G or H. Not the case F, therefore H. The problem, of course, is that in our first premise, F is not on the side, the side of the disjunct by itself. It's also in a disjunct with G. So you can't just... Well, from, from the disjunct either F or G or H, not F, there is no conclusion that you can make directly from that. I would say, though, that you could, you could move the parentheses in one step with a replacement rule, and you'd end up with F or parentheses G or H, since it's not the case that F, you could then end up with H or G, or rather G or H, right? That would validly come from that. But it wouldn't be an application of disjunctive syllogism. There would be several other steps. Okay, so how do we justify applying these rules of inference? So the format we use is, um, I, I did it once on the board, but S. P would be 
my conclusion. But how do I write the argument up here? If S than P, S, therefore, P. And now how do I prove it? Well, okay, so what I want to do is show that I can get this from that. And here it is. And then I have to justify how I got this step. And what I can say is lines one and two, modus cona. And that's your justification. Of course, this is incredibly simple, right? But we'll get more and more complex ones. So the next page, we have an example of multiple rules of inference. This is page 390. So premise one says, not the case R. Premise two says, but if P then S. Premise three says, either R or not S. Premise four says not the case P, then Q. The conclusion of the argument is so therefore Q. So assume this is, remember these are each statements. Right. And so someone gives you this argument, and the conclusion is Q, and you want to see, does this follow validly from these premises? But we can apply multiple uh, implication rules to this as part of our calculus and see if it will come out of that. So the first step they show here is that I can get not the case S, and where did that come from? Well, if you look up here, here's S here, and here's not the case S here, right? Where could we get that? Well, if we have not R, disjunctive syllogism will give us this. So our first step says that from lines one and three, right, from this line and from this line, I used disjunctive syllogism, and I got not S, right? Because if you remember, P or Q, right? not the case P, therefore Q, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, here's R or not S. That's like your P or Q, right? But not P would be the not of what's on the left. So therefore, what's on the right? So that's a valid conclusion from See it? That's follow using the pattern destructive syllogism, right? Next, I can go and look at not getting not P out of this. Where did, where did they get not P? Well, here's not P, but I would have to have um, that's, that's not going to make it say So here, if you look at this one, it goes, if P, then S. I just got not S. Modus tollens, P, then Q, but not Q, then not P, right? Well, this isn't if P, then Q, it's if P, then S, but not S, so then not P. So I'm using lines two, Five modus tollens. Right? You still have to solve for Pardon? You still have to solve like for These are the premises. Right. So all of these are given, and this is the point where you get the conclusion. And so this way of writing it up like this tells us these are my premises. So I don't have to try to solve these, ah. I start off with my steps from where the conclusion is given to try to see can that conclusion come from these premises. So step five, I'm using lines one and three. 
By the way, once I have these steps, I can use these too, right? as I did here, uh, because what I, I get here is not P, and I had to use line 5 in order to get this from this, right? And I'm going to be using this now too, right? And my next step is to get the conclusion Q, and where does that come from? It comes from here with this, right? So this is modus ponens, P then Q. But I do have P. Notice P in this case is not P, right? But that's what I have here. So that's four and six modus ponens. Okay. That's, that's given in your book, page 390, right? So that, and that's a proof, by the way. And some of the ones that we'll be looking at uh, for the test three will be a, exactly that sort. So those are the kinds of things you're looking at doing. So the exercises we have on this uh, set here, starting 8B, we should do. So you get a, a sense of how this works, right? And notice they're giving us the first four implication rules to work with. So the problems that we have here won't be more difficult than that. They're just going to be using modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, and disjunctive syllogism. Of course, going over these, uh, the idea just the same as, as with the syllogisms uh, as, a, as a system is that when you get used to using valid argument forms, uh, then you uh, can expect, uh, hopefully, to think that way, to, to recognize good reasoning as you go. And so we're, we're emphasizing good, valid arguments. Let's, let's go ahead and, and emphasize these, practice these. So let's do some from exercise 8B, it's page 390. They give us the first example. So premise one, if P then Q, premise Two is P, Hermes three is Q. Oops, I'm sorry. This is where the conclusion. So this is just going to be modus ponens. And they're just showing how you would write it down. One, two, and P. In fact, in this section, all they're asking you to do is write the rule in the blank. And so what they're doing is showing you that the first one is MP, modus ponens. That's all you would have to do, right, to recognize it. So for example, problem two. If P then Q, if Q then R, so therefore if P then R. So do you recognize that's hypothetical syllogism? That's the modus, that, that's the, um, the valid argument form there is hypothetical syllogism. So in the blank, you would just write H, S. Which, which example is that? That's problem number two on page 390. Because if P then Q, if Q then R, therefore if P then R. So that's just hypothetical syllogism. The only thing that's different is that they uh, capitalize the letters to throw you off just a little bit. <laughs> so super kind of them. Pardon? That was so super kind of them. Yeah. Did it work? It did. How about that? Number three, if R then S, 
premise 2, but it's not the case that S. So the conclusion is not the case that R. Which one do you think that is? Modus tollens. So all you'd have to do is put MT there. Number four. Either P and Q or if R then S. Premise two. It's not the case P and Q. So the conclusion is if R then S. How did they get if R then S? What goes in the blank? Disjunctive? Disjunctive syllogism. Very good. DS, right? Number five. If Q, then R or S, not the case R or S, therefore not the case Q. How did they get not the case Q? Modus tollens. Modus tollens. Yes? See how these connect? You know, this is this is how you memorize. Am I allowed to say that? That's an evil word. <laughs> Number six, not the case if, well, I should say it correctly. If, not the case, R or S, then, if P, then Q. Premise two, it's not the case either R or S. So therefore, if P then Q. How did they get that? Disjunctive syllogism? No. The negation sign threw you off. But in this case, the negation sign, not the case R or S, is exactly what is in the antecedent. So this is actually modus ponens. Right? Just like if P then Q. But P in this case is not the case R or S. See how they threw you with that? But they're, they're introducing something that's different here so that you recognize that these inference rules are the shape of the thought and that they can throw more and more complex things into these and yet you're still looking at that basic inference. Right? It looks more complex. They're deliberately doing that, of course, so that you begin recognizing that, aha, it doesn't have to look like if P then Q, P therefore Q, right? It can look like not the case R or S, then if P then Q. And that's still if this then that. And so we do have the this part, so we do have the that part, modus ponens, right? Number seven, if P and Q then R, if R then not P, so therefore if P and Q then not P. Remember, we're just using modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, or disjunctive syllogism. So what shape is that? That's hypothetical syllogism, right? See how it gets, though, when they add more and more complexity to what you're seeing? But the, the goal, of course, is for you to be able to see more and more complex things, but recognize that the basic inference that's going on is one of our val basic valid rules. Right? Number eight, if P then Q, then if R then S. But it's not the case if R then S, so therefore it's not the case if P then Q. Modus tollens. Modus tollens. Do you see it? No. Well, modus tollens goes if P then Q, but it's not the case that Q. Oh, 
Right. Therefore, it's not the case that P. Right. So when we look at this one, if P then Q, then if R then S. Right. But it's not the case that R then S. So, so the P then Q part is much more complex looking because there's right. two conditional statements on either side of the conditional. Right? We could do that. We could get infinitely more and more complex. But the inference is staying very simple. So just, just watch for the shape of the inference, right? Number nine, if R then S, I'm sorry, I misread that, sorry, either if R then S, then if P then Q. It's not the case if R then S. Is that the one we just did? No, this is disjunctive syllogism. So therefore, if P, then Q. Disjunctive syllogism. You guys getting bored to death? We could, we could skip further down. How about 13? If R, then either S or R. Premise 2. If either S or R then P. Therefore, if R, then P. Hypothetical syllogism. How about 15? Either S or if P, then Q. But it's not the case that S, therefore, if P, then Q. disjunctive syllogism. <laughs> now, the next page, the exercise is basically the same, but now what they're doing is leaving blank the conclusion that you would get from that argument, right? So if I'm looking at number one, notice, Either if Q then S or P, premise two, but not the case if Q then S. So what would be my conclusion there if I use disjunctive syllogism? No. Then P? P. Yay. Yay. And they give you that, right? So answer well, is do. P, right? But next one. Number two, if P then, either Q or S, P is the case, so therefore, Q or, Q or, S. Q or S. Very good. Modus ponens, right? A little bit more complex looking. Number three, if K or L, then K or N. Premise two, if K or N, then K or S. Clearly, we're using hypothetical syllogism, and what would we get K if or K L or L, L then K or, K or S. S? See it? This is almost fun, isn't it? Number four, if either T or R, then either Q or S, not the case Q or S. This is just modus tollens. So the conclusion would be not, not the, the case, case T, T or R. R. Let's go down to 10. A little bit more complex. If S, then not the case, not the case R or not the case T. S. So therefore, not, not the, the case, case not the case R, or not, not the case T. Modus ponens, right? Yes? Yes. So there's lots of different things we could look at with that. So the 
question is if we have a negation sign parentheses and inside the parentheses we have not the case R or not the case T. So the question is what kind of power does that negation sign have on what's in the parentheses? Yes, it obviously does impact it. And what, what it could do is we can change this to adopt. Bring this in here and have not not R and not not T. But two knots cancel one another, so that's a positive. And these two knots cancel one another, so that's T. So this is equivalent to R and T. Why does it go from being R to and? If we look at the next section, which we haven't gotten to yet, obviously. Or you go back to the back and you look under our replacement rules, the 10 replacement rules. And the very first one is De Morton's. De Morton's has two parts. So, if I have not the case P and Q, it's equivalent to not the case P or not the case Q. And if I have not the case P or Q, that's equivalent to not the case P and not the case Q. So if we look at if this is our our template, right? Not the case P and not the case Q. I look at this, I have not the case, not the case R and not the case, not the case that. Double negation tells me that I basically have R and T. But how did I get this out of here with the negation in front of it? So if I'm looking at this statement here, where I have not the case P or Q, and that's equivalent to this, what happens if I have this in here, which is what I have up there? That would give me that. But you could use double negation to get rid of the two negations, and you get R and T. But the question you ask is actually even more interesting than how do I physically do it? What does it mean? Why does this change from the wedge to the dot? So if I think, what's that first one say? It says, it's not the case that I don't have R or I don't have T. So that means I do have R and I do have T. Because it's not the case that I don't have R or I don't have T. So I'm saying, well, because I must have both. Of them. 
But whenever you bring the negation sign into the parentheses, the main operator will switch. You'll notice in both of these. <clears throat> here's, here's your one possibility, right? If I bring that negation sign in here, it goes in front of both of them, but the dot changes to an or. So if it's not the case that I have P and Q, it's equivalent to saying it's not the case that I have P or it's not the case that I have Q, because I'm saying I don't have both. But I might have one or the other. What does what does this show here? Or no, just what is that one and what do the issues change to Ah, so so the other ones will change as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so if you're if you're changing a statement. Um, and well so if we look at the um, replacement rules, that's essentially what are we doing? We're, we're showing, here's a statement, and then we can say, well, is there another way for you to say exactly the same thing, but for it to look different? There is. So all the replacement rules are equivalencies. In other words, they're not logically different, even though they look different. Say, so with these, I can go from this one to this one, and back, no logical change, right? They're equivalent, right? That, and of course, that's what the equivalence, the tri bar means, right? Um, but for example, the, the next one, um, if you're looking at the replacement rules, double negation, right? So if I have, if I have P, that is equivalent to not, not P. And of course, that's, that's not just, remember, P is a, a variable that stands for anything, any true or false statement, even a compound statement, right? So this is, this is a pretty significant thing. But we, we know this. Um, in fact, it, it causes, I think, problems in English uh, because there are some people that use double negation routinely when they mean single no negation. And that often will get grammarians upset or folks that speak the King's English or, or something of that sort. Uh, it indicates grammatical incorrectness on the part of the person that says, I ain't got no, right? But the odd thing is if you look at other languages, Almost every language I can think of uses double negation to indicate single negation, which makes it hard for you to learn that. Like, je ne sais quoi, je ne sais pas. So, so you're using a double negation in French. Does German do the same thing? You have a kind Antwort. I have no answer. Probably not. But French is weird that way. But English doesn't use double negation, and yet you certainly can use double negation. But what happens when you say, I don't have no milk? Correctly speaking, that's supposed to say, I do have milk. I don't have no milk, means I do have some milk. Yes? But we don't usually speak that way because it's confusing. And mom will always say, you mean you don't have any milk? And if you, you say, no, I don't have no milk, see, I still have a half a cup. She's going to dump it on your head. 
Well, maybe not. Depends on your mother, I suppose. But, but this doesn't stop the IRS from using double negation all the time. And when you say, you know, you did not embezzle that money, but nor did you embezzle any other money. So it's not the case that you embezzled money from either embezzled income or unembezzled income. I'm totally making this up. But you get the idea, right? You know, then you're you're puzzled because you're sitting there trying to figure out, wait a minute, where are the negations here? Because there's multiple ways of applying them in English. You could say none, not, un, right? Neither, nor, right? So it's very confusing. So notice there are some sections in here that help uh, with translating from everyday speech into the symbols. Uh, the idea of the symbols was that you could uh, translate it into the symbols and that will help you understand what the heck they're trying to say, right? Um, fortunately, we don't really even have to read IRS documents anymore. We just use TurboTax. And TurboTax asks us, fill in the blank, any embezzled income? What? It's illegal to embezzle income. Why would anybody have embezzled income? And if they did, why would they report it? Because if you don't report it, then you can get in trouble and you're for in tax trouble evasion. For, and yeah. For That's how they were able to. Yes, they got Al Capone. Al Capone, right? Couldn't think of his name. That's how they got Guzman, too. Mm. The one that's just been found guilty and sentenced, but I don't remember what his sentence is. El Chapo. Right? Didn't they just get him for... He murdered all these people, but they can't prove any of those. But we got you on tax evasion. Seems like... Now, if you were a billionaire in Florida, you could have hundreds of teenage girls that you've been messing with. <laughs> and what did they get him for? He had pictures in the safe. And you're not allowed to have any of those. Plus, he loaded them, he digitized them, and he loaded them on a hard drive that was Chinese-made, so that's international. Who is this? What's his name? At Epstein? Epstein? Is somebody drilling my head, or is that? Mm -hmm. But there are no dentists up here. They do that to your face. I wouldn't go back if they did that to my face. They've got the lower floor in our dentist. I hope they stop. I've seen it on, t on, on a movie where the professor asked a sexy student to go and lean out the window and ask them to stop. Mm -mm. And they did, you know. Did you see that movie that was a Beautiful Mind? He ended up marrying her. That's very annoying. You don't hear that drill? I totally hear it. It's awful. I think you're Well, I hope so. <laughs> and my ears aren't working very well if they're not hearing anything. Okay, so let's do another one. Commutation. This one will really throw you. Commutation. Does it really throw you? P or Q. So, if I say I have oranges or peaches, What's the difference between my saying I have peaches 
or oranges. No difference. You can get really picky here and you say, well, yes, in this case, the peaches are on the left and the oranges are on the right, and here the oranges are on the left and the peaches are on the right. That could be a big difference, especially if oranges in your picture are interpreted as a symbol of promiscuity. Are you going to hit him with your purse? Oh yeah, I'm gonna beat the hell out of him. I'm glad, but I can't, you know, take responsibility. <laughs> Just so you know. Yeah, you could be. You could get picky, but really, that's like the same as that's, uh, versus passive. That's one of Monet's paintings. The uh, something that I can't remember the the bar, the one with the the one with the swing. She's st the the woman standing there by the bar, and Monet is actually in the mirror. He's the guy standing looking at her, and he's also in the mirror. You can try to figure out if that really gets the angle right. So he sees himself as a woman? No. No. But she has a bowl of oranges, and at the time, I've understood from, from art analysis that oranges stood for promiscuity. Basically, she was a... Prostitute. Not only was she selling the liquor at the bar, but she was also pointing out to customers that she was available. So oranges in a. So it's not my fault. Um, so so if your your oranges are on one side or the other, it could actually be meaningful, but. <laughs> If it's a painting. But the thing is, when we're talking about these logical operators, that is the same as this. And it works the same way when we go like this. Those are the same. They're equivalent. And this rule is called commutation. Or just one M, sorry. Only one M. I see four dots. Ah, yes, they have four dots there instead of this. Okay. But it means the same thing in this particular. I have a easier time doing this than I do this. And they mean the same thing, so... I don't know why he uses that symbol instead of equivalence. Other books. So I'm I'm looking at the ten replacement rules. Um, we got started on this because of De Morgan's, but we do need to do these. But let's 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 go back to where we were. I suppose we will catch up with those. Okay. So section three of the exercises we were doing, page 393. Now, in this section, we have examples that contain more than one step. And in this case, we're supposed to provide the line numbers needed for the derivation and the implication rule as justification. So if we're, we're looking at number one, notice if P then Q, I'm sorry, if P then not Q, 
premise 2, if R then Q, premise 3, P, the conclusion is not R. Step 4 comes from those premises, and what they're asking you for are the lines and the abbreviation of the inference rule that you're using to get it. So how would we get not Q out of the lines above? Well, if we look at if P then not Q, and not Q is what we've gotten, right? But P is also there, line three. If the noise downstairs is bothering. It's downstairs. It's in Cuban. Drilling. So you can't go in there with a gun and a mask. They'll shoot you. Yes, I can. <laughs> no, I don't want you to get shot. Uh, anything for the 1277 an hour. Um, but, <laughs> I know, really. but I could move you down the hall and get you some Are they going to keep doing that? It's really I, annoying. I, they're pulling electrical. They're doing electrical work. So they're going to be working all evening. So how many folks would mind moving to another room? You would mind? You're the one oh, I wouldn't mind. mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind. So we'll sorry. move. Okay, I've if got a classroom a... open for you. You can do the technology there as needed. I don't, yeah. I don't I... think you can hear it down, down there. Cool. Yeah, we can take a break till 7.30, but what room are we going to end it's up in? It's directly across. It's the one with all the computers. Oh, okay. Um, the lab. The lab, I guess. yes. Yeah, it's not like there's nothing to solve while we're working on there at times. Like, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could go down and ask him to stop. But I, I don't think we'd be very useful. <laughs> that, only, that only works in the so, movies. <laughs> <laughs>